Kevin Forsman, and I'm the regional sales manager for Swan Analytical. I take care of the Midwest. I go from North Dakota all the way to Tennessee. So I've seen a lot of different water treatment systems, and uh, I want to introduce my company to you for a minute. Um, a lot of people don't know who we are. Swan is a Swiss company. Uh, it's based out of um, just outside of Zurich, and we have a world-class reputation for making um, PPD and PPT instruments that are used in steam cycles. Um, most of the Minnesota power plants, <coughs> excuse me, and XL Energy here in the state use our silica, sodium, DO, lot more instruments. And so this presentation was uh, done by Randy Turner, our technical director, and um, I haven't really practiced this one much, but let's get into it. Uh, when I first started in this business, um, years and many years ago, I was at a meeting and we were uh, representing a company called Great Lakes Instruments, which was out of Milwaukee, and they had a uh, turbinometer that they designed after the crypto sperm outbreak there in the 90s. Anybody remembers that? A lot of people died. And so, anyway, the, the turbinometer that they designed used an LED light source. And the discussion here is going to be about that as well. Um, <coughs> the sales guy at that time was Don Lex, and I don't know if you guys knew it, but turbidity, the original measurement of turbidity, was for beer. And so, um, the Germans used to take a beer sign with a candle and look at the light reflected through the, the mug itself. And that was the original intention of turbidity. So, yes, there is regulations. Um, this instrument lends itself well. The original concept with the measurement was for drinking water. So, surface water treatment plants, um, by law, uh, have to have a turbidity meter on every one of their filters and a combined filter effluent. Uh, we found out with a few years this thing's been in the market that it works great on clarifier effluents and wastewater applications. So what is turbidity? Um, it is a characteristic of not just water, it also can be a beer, um, and it's an optical property. And so basically you use some kind of light source and some kind of photo detector to measure um, the light that's going to be absorbed by those particles. <clears throat> something like uh, milk would be something very turbid. Um, I had some instruments installed in water plants on Lake Michigan, microfiltration plants, where they're literally measuring the turbidity down at 0.006 NTUs. Amazingly clean water. Randy put this in the, in the slide for me, and I still haven't been able to verify that, but uh, there are some old timers that I've talked to that said that this is correct, 1912. Um, <coughs> they had a, uh, the very first one was a platinum wire, and which eventually became a, a Jackson candle. But this was, this is actually really cool, that they needed to come up with a way to measure water quality. And, I have not been able to find one of these. Um, I do have some pictures of Jackson candles. Um, there's a water museum in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they have them on display, and they're pretty cool. So in the 30s, that's when that was designed, and the Jackson candle basically was a, a, a cylinder with a candle underneath it, and they would put water in it, and they would, um, they would add water in until, until you couldn't get to the point where you could see the flame. And then that was an indication of what the turbidity was. And that was used for quite a while. I mean, nephilometric methods of measuring turbidity literally um, <clears throat> came about in the 70s. So basically 40 years before companies made instruments that you could actually measure it. This is a standard for drinking water. Most drinking water systems that I've seen in the Midwest 
they, they, their wells load up. Anybody here in this room used to bend meters? Couple? Water or wastewater? So, the measurement. Um, basically, you need to have some type of light source. There's various kinds. And in the measurement of drinking water, the um, EPA approved method, which is 181, calls for a white tungsten light source, which is actually at 515 nanometers. So that's the, um, what is on here is the appropriate wavelength. We actually make an instrument like that looks just like this one that uses a red LED light source. It's at 860 nanometers, and it can measure higher ranges. Formism. That's the standard. That's what um, instruments are calibrated with. This is an interesting thing, too. You'll see this uh, as a European standard, formazin, nephilometric unit, or you can also have what are called NTUs, which is a nephilometric committee unit. The two are interchangeable. Um, I've seen some old instruments that actually say JTU, Jackson Trinity Units, the Jackson Candle, same thing, same unit. Um, doesn't matter. The interesting thing about formazin is if you've made it up or if you've ever messed with it, it's very unstable. Um, it's also a, a car carcinogen. And you have to be careful when you handle it. And it also, typically you buy it in 4,000 NTU values and you dilute it to put it in your instrument to calibrate. And what I find interesting about formazin as, as a compound goes, it, it's nothing like the particles that you see in water. It's, it, there, it's like bowling balls in the water. The molecular structure is really large. But it's still our standard and it's amazing to me that you know, all these years we're still using it. So this is a typical measurement, and I should go back here again. The measurement of turbidity is a ratio. So various companies that over the years have designed instruments that use different types of light sources. Um, there's, there's some out there that use lasers. There's some out there that use LEDs like ours. Besides the GLI 95T, this is the only instrument on the market that's used with a laser or excuse me, use a LED light source. And most of the instruments that are on the market use a tungsten light source. And the issue that you have with that is that with tungsten light sources, as you turn them on, they age. The filament in there um, changes its intensity. The spectrum on it changes, and you have to calibrate an instrument typically every 90 days in order to uh, compensate for that aging light. <clears throat> so the measurement itself is actually at a right angle, just like the Bierstein. And so um, I don't know what the turbidity of Bud Light is, don't ask me, but we can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it, there is, this is the ratio part. So you're actually looking at, there's two photo detectors in the measurement, and you're looking at ratio between the two. Does that make sense? Basic stuff. And again, uh, when you're measuring drinking water, this speckle response has to be 500 and it's actually between 400 and 600 nanometers is the uh, 181 method. Is that what, what is the LED and the, the laser or the Like the LED that they, st they still have to they still have to be within 400 to 600 nanometers in order to uh, again if you if you design any turbidimeter at all and you don't use a tungsten light source, you have to get approval by the EPA, meaning that you have to, you have to submit your method and then you go through the entire test and then they, if your method is approved, then they list it in the Federal Register as, a, as an approved method, <coughs> which we did with this. This is, uh, again, that's a European ISO 7027. Um, similar to 181. Yes, it's a, it's a, again, it's a ratio measurement. Um, and again, formism is the standard. 
this slide basically saying what previous ones did. And I guess this is key right here. The accuracy of the calibration solution is the accuracy of the measurement. And if you don't have or have not properly made up a good calibration standard, your slope will be off and you will have inaccurate readings. So is stable cal better than using your own or what? Stable cal, the, the one thing about stable cal, it's, a, it's, a, it's stable. It's, a, it's actually a decent product. Um, but you can, you can use either one if you calibrate it and analyze it. It doesn't matter. It's expensive though. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it? Yeah, I mean, but again, it's the accuracy of making it that, that standard up. Typically, when you calibrate your bitometers over the years, most manufacturers recommend that you use a 20 NTU um, standard as your, you know, that you calibrate the instrument with. Um, interesting, I was in a, a drinking water plant in Wisconsin and watched one of the guys calibrate Brand X turbidity, or I won't need to say it, but um, he, he was zeroing the instrument with distilled water. And I, and I looked at him and I went, what are you doing? Well, this is our procedure. And I'm like, okay. You realize that, that in distilled water you have turbidity of typically between 0.3 and 0.4 into it's not, it's not zero. And so you're zeroing the instrument with something that's not zero. So it's just silly. Um, yes, um, this analyzer from Swan, in the design of the instrument, what they did um, is they calibrate this more accurately to the factory and, and our recommendation is that this instrument never requires calibration, ever. And I have utilities that now have had them in three years and still haven't touched it. It still works perfectly. It doesn't drift. Because of the LED in there? That's part of it. Yeah, I'm going to go over that. But the Swiss, um, what they've done with a lot of their analyzers is they make up standards that are, you know, precise. And this is a secondary standard, but we call it the verification kit because this allows you to take this and verify these things that they're working properly without making up forms of it. And they have a time date stamp that you did it. <laughs> I'll be glad to show anybody this after this is over. Um, and I'll be glad to take the instrument apart. Um, the Swiss have been making turbidimeters for, oh goodness, I think since about 1992. So it's going on 20 some years. And this particular instrument um, was one of their first ones. And it's not regulatory, it's not approved in the US. I actually have furnished a couple of these to power plants, um, but I don't want to mess with them because they got like a desiccant inside here for condensation. That's maintenance. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. So, this is our turbo well. Um, the method of measurement is called a turbo well. So, some interesting things on this on this instrument. Um, optically, up above, this is part is the measuring part. And so, there's a light source, and there's a photo detector that are hermetically sealed inside here, and the lenses on these things never touch the water. There's a, a constant head on the measurement in the back. And so what it does is it maintains a kind of specific level inside here. And so optically, that light source and photo detector never touch the water. So you don't have to worry about cleaning um, it. Amazingly for me, I've got these installed in power plants and um, a, a real good application is clarifier effluent. And traditional turbidity designs, clarifier effluent, you've got to clean them all the time. Or paint it a nuisance. Um, <coughs> up above, this thing here is a, a degasser. This, um, I just furnished uh, two of these to um, a utility in uh, Michigan. Um, it was a membrane filtration plant. And when they test their integrity of their filters, um, they use air. They pressurize the membrane itself on a periodic basis with compressed air that you know, uh, test the integrity of the membrane itself. And <coughs> they get high air trapped in them. 
So some cool things about this analyzer. Um, up above here, there's actually a PID controller in the electronics that maintains an exact 50 degree C inside the electronics. It, it, it maintains a constant temperature in here so we don't have problems with condensation. And I, I know because I've got them all over Lake Michigan now and all the samples coming in are one degree C right now this time of year. So they, they, they work all the time without any condensation forming inside it. Um, the LED light source that's on this thing has a life expectancy of somewhere near 150,000 hours. Um, it's not something that just burns out. It li literally should last 20 years. And because what we're doing with this, um, inside the instrument, I don't know if I have a, that's a little better of a diagram, but let me see what this thing looks like. In the instrument itself, excuse me, the sample comes in and there's a constant head overflow on the inlet and then that overflows to drain and then the sample itself then comes in through the chamber and comes up and then that's channeled to drain. And again, up above, this is the light source and that's the photo detector. They never touch the sample. Amazingly smart design. Um, I, it's one of the coolest instruments I've ever seen. Um, they, on the instrument itself, we have a secondary drain because we know over time you're going to get sand and silt and sediment and, and build up inside here. And you can either do that manually or we actually have an electronic drain that you can put on here that you can program the instrument to do the auto drain for you. And so, um, example, I just furnished two of these to uh, City of Wyoming, Michigan on their raw water coming in from Lake Michigan. And they, they fill up with sand. And so they, they literally just have it, it drains itself four times a day. And it's, they work flawlessly. I mean, they, they did a trial last year for like nine months and determined that it worked perfect. So they bought two finally. Um, <coughs> again, we have two versions on this instrument. One of them is 850 nanometers. I said 860 before I corrected. And then the white LED is this version. And it's a long story with SWAN, but when SWAN submitted this instrument to the EPA, they approved it, and they approved the method. And our original design used this wavelength. And after we actually started making them in production, when we started the SWAN USA uh, back in 2010, um, the EPA uh, called Chris Trayer, our president, and asked us to redesign our design to make it a white LED because 181 method uh, EPA method calls for a white tungsten light source. So we actually have two designs on this instrument because of the EPA. I, I mean, thank, we thank them very much. That was, that was nice of them. So the analyzer itself, again, it, this is the electronics part that's up above. This actually comes apart. Excuse me. I know my camera. This is how you can, if you needed to do maintenance, you can do that. Is that where you put that sample cell in for doing Yes, the verification kit, correct. Yeah, I can plug it in and show you. I mean, it, it'll work. Uh, again, um, what's not shown on this drawing is there is a, um, there actually is a beam splitter in here, and what that does is that monitors the intensity of the light source itself, which actually ties in with the circuit which maintains the intensity so it actually never varies at all. And also, too, that's part of that ratio measurement, if that makes sense. Very stable instrument. And this is our verification kit. And again, this is designed to fit optically in the path of the light source and the photo detector, and it literally when you go into the diagnostics of the instrument, you can actually see that all the energy that's on that light source is found its way to the photo detector. It's really cool. And it's, again, each one of these has an individual QA value from SWAN. Um, some people ask me if we can recertify these. The answer is yes, but you really shouldn't have to unless you drop it, which I've done. Yeah, so that's how it fits in there, you ask me. That's how the instrument is. There's a little 
locking piece right on here, and it, it literally just fits in there perfectly. It's amazing. And so uh, I'm wrapping this up, and i sorry I don't have all these good pictures on this slide. Randy submitted this one. Um, we're using an LED, not a tungsten, very stable. Um, and then this is what what every everybody just blows their mind when we say this. When the, it, it's interesting too because when we first came up with this instrument in 2010, um, the Swiss in the firmware, the analyzer, they were so proud of this instrument they would not let anybody calibrate it. And so we found out that there's like seven states in America like Texas and uh, I got two in my territory, Ohio, and um, they actually have um, a state regulation that you have to calibrate the instruments you know, on a periodic basis, which is more stringent than the federal um, 40 CFR 174 reg, which states that you calibrate analyzers per manufacturer's recommendations. And so, um, we, 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 we were banging our head against the wall with that because these states wouldn't allow the instrument to be accepted. So we had to actually go in and convince them that they have to be able to, be a, do, a, to do a calibration. And now we can. You can actually go in the instrument, put formulas in our stable cal inside there, push a button, and calibrate it. Although we don't recommend it. And that's the, the again, whoops, that's the, the approved lifetime, you know, it, 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 and again, I, when I started at SWAN, I started at the beginning of 2010, and the very first uh, place that I went to was Michigan City, Indiana, uh, their drinking water plant. It's a conventional treatment plant on Lake Michigan. They have 12 filters, and um, the guy that runs the plant's a friend of mine, and I said, I got this really cool instrument from SWAN. They tell me it's great, but I don't know anything about it. Can, can you put one in? And he said, Jared. And they, they, they had the old GLIs which were failing on them and so he, um, he, let, me, he let me put it in and I said, I, he said, how long do you want me to put it in? And I said, one year. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, one year. I, mean, I need to know, because Lake Michigan turns over twice a year, you know, what's going to happen when that happens in the spring and fall, you know, it, what's the sensor going to do? We're going to find out. After nine months, he actually sent me an email, said, send me a bill. It's on my, it's on my, my filter F1. It's the most, it's the best instrument in my whole facility. And send me a quote for uh, 11 more. And he's now got all these guys are blowing around. So for three years, he's had this instrument of the light filter F1, no maintenance. So he's got one on each filter? Then? He's got one on every filter. He's got one on his combined filter F1. <laughs> and he also has um, one on the raw. We put one of these in January last year on his raw water. It had it in over a year and no maintenance, nothing. I mean, it's insane. Um, I have a steel mill in Northwest Indiana called ArcelorMittal. Um, it's, a, it's an enormous steel mill. They actually have six um, turbines. They generate their own electricity. It's bigger than a lot of power plants. And um, in their makeup water, they have this thing called a hot process softening. And basically, it's a line clarifier um, with um, Line. It's a line blanket, basically, and what they do is they take uh, low pressure steam into this into the sample, and they bring Lake Michigan water into it, and then they take they monitor the clar the effluent. It's basically clarifier effluent in a way, and they've had these in, two of them in for like two years, and they don't even have the auto drain on them, which I recommended. They just do it periodically themselves. It's amazing. I mean, there's like no maintenance to it. And I mean, the guys are like, your stuff's great. I mean, they have our all our sodium and our silica. And, you know. So um, I have these, I just have a ton of references. I mean, it's just an amazing instrument. And um, the Swiss are very proud of their analyzers. They actually have um, three year warranties on all their electronics. And um, with this particular instrument, we actually have a full four year warranty on the whole thing. So it, it's, I, I don't think I have a single problem out there right now in a couple of hundred installations. Uh, maybe one, but <clears throat> anyway. Oh, questions? Okay. When you're talking about you have the auto drain or you just got the manual drain on there. Mm -hmm. If you only have the manual, how do you know how often is there is there a way that the, the 
meter kind of tells you that it's getting a build up in there? I, I would I would say yes um, because usually um, I've tried these without the drain on um, on flock on settled water applications and it usually takes about a day or two but you start seeing like a well, you know I don't want to say a sludge level of what it is it's that's what flock is basically so um, yes the readings are going to start creeping up on you and you know yeah it's but the auto the interesting thing about this design too and it, 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 when I first got a hold of this, this is actually um, closed. Okay. That's open. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, this is Swiss engineering. They're doing everything backwards from us yeah. crazy Americans. But I said, well, that's, but it's the, the reason they did this is they knew that um, these will be installed in places where you got like vibration pumps and VFDs and things shaking. And so they knew that what would happen is this drain itself by the vibration would eventually you know, cause bad readings. So they designed it this way so it can't really vibrate up. But that's been very, very clever. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and, and again, with Swan, just the FYI, um, all these things that I pulled out of here in this brochure that I showed you, th these are how these analyzers look. They, they're, they're completely mounted on a back panel they're piped, they're wired. Um, the Swiss actually wet bench test these before the ship. They're fully functional instruments. Um, that's pretty cool. It's, it's nice for maintenance. And with all of our chlorine analyzers and, and water quality instruments like this, they're all on a PVC back panel. Our power stuff's all on stainless. But <clears throat> then this guy here, from a maintenance point of view, I get leery when it's on the stand, but that's the cutaway of it. So this is your inlet, this is that constant head overflow part, and then it samples itself and it comes back into the instrument and goes to drain. What's the cost of something? It's, uh, it's $3,950. These verification kits typically run about eight or nine hundred bucks, depending on if it's a lower or high range. And thank you. Thank you all very much and appreciate it.